But you know, the story of Mephibosheth is one of my favorite stories uh, out of the life of King David. And in my view, it's, it's really one of those stories you don't hear uh, a lot about. I mean, it's not as exciting as David, you know, slaying Goliath. Um, it doesn't ha have the same scandalous appeal as David and, and his sin with Bathsheba. You know, it's not as epic as David uniting the southern and the northern kingdoms together as Israel as into one nation. It doesn't have as much, you know, sizzle as God making his covenant with David uh, to put a king uh, through, the, um, through David's throne, uh, through his lineage uh, for eternity. But the life of Mephibosheth is probably one of the most powerful stories of God's grace in the Old Testament. And so I want to look at it tonight. And so let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 4. And first of all, we're going to ask, who is Mephibosheth? Who is Mephibosheth? Well, in verse 4 we read, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So we read here that Mephibosheth was the son of David's best friend, Jonathan. And his name actually wasn't originally Mephibosheth. That wasn't what he was called at birth. What he was called at birth was Marib Baal, which means the enemy of Baal. That's initially what Mephibosheth went by. And his name indicates that his dad had high hopes for him. I mean, if you remember, Jonathan was a warrior, right? He was a mighty warrior. Saul was a warrior. And so, you know, you know here comes, you know, Mary Baal. He's going to be a warrior too. He's going to be an enemy of Baal. He's going to go out and conquer all of God's enemies. You know, destroy the idols. He was going to be a fighter of Baal, just like his dad and his granddad. But we read that when he was five years old, he was tragically injured. You know, at this time, his dad, Jonathan and Saul, were killed in the battle on Mount Gilboa. And when the news of their death arrived, fear gripped the hearts of everyone that was there in the home. And they packed their belongings up as quickly as they could, and they ran for their lives. I mean, how many of you know that fear is a powerful motivator, right? You know, a lot of times, we don't want to change anything until we're afraid we're going to lose something. And so in her heart, the nurse that was taking care of Mary Baal was probably thinking if they killed Saul and they killed Jonathan, then they're going to kill who's next in line. They're going to wipe out the entire lineage. And of course, who was next in line? Mephibosheth. He would have been the next in line. And so they're going to come after the heir to the throne. And so her fight or flight response kicked in, and she picks up little Mephibosheth to get out of there. And, and how many of you have seen a little five-year-old run? I mean, not like as a, when you're a grandparent, but, you know, when you're an actual parent. You can actually keep up with your kids at that age, you know. But when you're trying to run and dash out of something, they don't run very fast, do they? They're not the quickest on their feet. And I could imagine that she picks them up, you know, because couldn't, he couldn't move fast enough on his own, and she's running out, and she trips and falls on his legs and breaks both of his legs, injuring him tragically for the rest of his life. And in one moment, his life changes. He goes from being Mary Baal, the enemy of Baal, to being Mephibosheth, which means the son of shame. Imagine being called that your whole life, the son of shame. It's amazing how one moment can change our lives. Next, we find Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And he's living with Machir, the son of Amiel, who's a close family friend and a descendant of Joseph. You know, the same Joseph that was second in command of, of Egypt. And he's living in a land called Lodabar. 
And Lodabar in Hebrew can mean one of two things. It can either mean no pasture or barren. So it's a barren land. Or it could mean no word. So if you can get a picture of this, here you have Mephibosheth, the son of shame, and he's living in a barren land where there is no word from God. It's a picture of hopelessness. I mean, his life was hopeless. Now you have to ask yourself, why was the nurse really so afraid of the Philistines? You know, that she would pick little Mephibosheth up and, and run and drop him and, and hurt him the way she, she did. I mean, especially when you remember that David, you know, King David was a giant slayer. He killed Goliath. The, the Israelites defeated the Philistines in battle. But in 1 Samuel 31, the Philistines are in hot pursuit of King Saul and his sons. They end up killing them in battle. And you have to ask yourself, where's David? Where's David, the mighty David, the mighty warrior? Where is he at this time? Well, at this time, David is fighting for the Philistines. We read about that in 1 Samuel 29. You know, it was well known that Saul was trying to kill David. So what does David do? He defects. He goes and he lives with the Philistines. And when news of Saul and his son's death came to the nurse, she wasn't just running from the Philistines. Who do you think she was running from? David. She was running from David. Oh, no. Saul has been after David. Now Saul's been killed. David's going to come back and he's going to get vengeance on the house of Saul. And he's going to take down Saul's heirs, including Mephibosheth. But what she didn't know was that David had made a covenant with Jonathan. And we read about that covenant in 1 Samuel chapter 20, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 17. It says this, And you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. And now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now if you notice here, the covenant that David makes with Jonathan it's not a covenant that's based on the law or obedience to the law. It's a covenant that is based on what? Love. It was a covenant that was based on his love between Jonathan and David. It says here, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. But you see, the nurse didn't know this. The nurse that was running with Mephibosheth, running from the Philistines, running from David, didn't know that David had made this covenant with Jonathan. So she was filled with fear, and her fear ended up crippling Mephibosheth. And she takes him to the land of Lodabar, where it's barren, no word. And when she gets him there, this is what she tells him. She says, listen, don't let anyone know who you are. Don't tell anybody that you're the son of the king. Don't tell anybody that you're an heir to the throne because if they find out who you really are, they're going to come and they're going to kill you. So you keep it a secret. David's going to find you out and he's going to kill you. And so Mephibosheth lives under the weight of fear, believing that David, his enemy, is out to kill him, is out to kill him. You know, there are many today who live in a place of barrenness where there's no word from God. They live in a state of fear, a constant state of fear, believing lies that others have spoken over them. They're filled with anxiety, looking over their shoulder. You believe that God is against you, that he's not really for you. And so you're, you're so careful to keep the law. You're so careful to do all the right things. You're afraid that if you, if you mess up just a little bit, something bad's going to happen to you. 
And so often, even when we're driving you know, on the freeway and we get a ticket, we think, oh, see, I deserve that. It must have been the argument I had with my wife earlier. Well, my wife and I, we don't argue. We just have intense times of fellowship. But, um, <laughs> and maybe that's why God is punishing me for something I did. And we don't realize that God has made a new covenant with man. And it's not a covenant that's based on law. It's not a covenant that's based on obedience to the law. It's a covenant that's based on love. The love that God has for his people. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God loves you. And his covenant with you is based on his love for you. It's not even based on your love for him. It's completely based on his love for you. I had a guy in my church come recently, and he said, you know, if you knew what I had done in my past, you wouldn't even let me in the building. And I said, David Zamora, you're welcome here anytime, <laughs> any place. And you can bring David Trujillo with you. <laughs> but isn't that the way we think sometimes? Isn't that how we really think? Man, God, if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't even let me in the building. And one of my favorite scenes in, in the Jesus movie is where the woman is caught in adultery. And the Pharisee comes up to Jesus and says, we caught this woman in adultery and the law tells us that we should stone her. And he walks up and he hands her Jesus a rock and he says, what do you say we do? And Jesus takes the rock and he goes to one guy and he goes, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And he walks to each one of the Pharisees and one by one, they all turn and leave. And then he goes to the woman and he says, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, they've all left. There's no one here to accuse me. And Jesus says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Now you have to understand the impact of what Jesus is saying. Who is the only person in that crowd that was without sin? Jesus. Who is the only person that was qualified to judge her? Jesus. Who wrote the law? Jesus. If there was a righteous judge that could pass righteous judgment on this woman who was found guilty in her sin, it was Jesus. And what does Jesus do? I didn't come to condemn you. I came to love you. Go and sin no more. And he set her free. Don't you love Jesus? I love that. You know, Mephibosheth didn't know about David's covenant of love, and so he lived in fear. I'm not an heir to the throne. I'm not a son of the king. I'm going to deny everything that I am. I'm not going to let anybody know. The other thing we know about Mephibosheth is that he believed a lie about David. And the lie that he believed about David was that David didn't like lame people. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, in 2 Samuel 5, we read about how David captures Jerusalem. And as David is approaching the city, the people begin taunting David as, as he's coming up to conquer the city. And they say, David, you are so lame. You're so powerless. Because our lame people can beat you up. Our blind people can slay you. You're nothing. And it says here, you know, that David got really irritated. In verse 8 it says, And David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, 
He shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now imagine you're Mephibosheth, and you're in the land of Lodabar. You're in a barren place. You're denying everything that you are. There's no word from God, and all of a sudden you get this word, David hates lame people. Not only that, but David says the lame will never even enter into his house. Now, was that true? Of course not. David didn't hate lame people. He hated the Jebusites that were taunting him. He didn't like being taunted by the Jebusites. But you know the story. David conquers Jerusalem. He conquers the Philistines, sets up the tabernacle in Jerusalem, brings the ark into the city. There's joy and celebration. And after David unites all of Israel and sets up his government, he remembers the covenant that he made with Jonathan. And so we see the story of grace begin in the life of Mephibosheth unfold in three parts. And the first part here is that Mephibosheth receives the benefit of of his father's co covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you want to turn there, 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. And it says this. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And so the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of David, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. And so David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table continually. Now, notice what David says here. He says, is there anyone left in the house of God that I may show the kindness of God to? Now, this word kindness in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word chesed. Can you say that? Chesed. You got to like clear your throat. Chesed. And what's interesting is that this word really doesn't have an English equivalent. The closest word we come to it is in the Greek, and it's the word charis that we use to translate into what? Grace. And so when he says here, is there anyone that I can show the kindness of God? He's asking, is there anyone here that I can show the grace of God to? Is there anyone here left of the house of Saul that I can show God's grace and favor upon? And Ziba, one of Saul's servants, says, I know that there's still one of Saul's son living. His, he's the son of Jonathan. And, 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 and you've got to understand here, the fact that Ziba was even there is, was, was testimony that David wasn't mad at anybody. He wasn't mad at Saul. He wasn't mad at Jonathan. He wasn't mad at any of the descendants of Saul because Ziba was their servant. But if you notice what Ziba says when he mentions Mephibosheth, what does he say? Well, David, there is one. It's Mephibosheth, but you've got to understand, he's lame. He's lame, David. You hate lame people. Don't you like those people that just like to tell all your weaknesses? Most of them marry uh, that person. Uh, most of us. Uh, <laughs> You know, when, when you just, you're just around and they, they just want to say something to, to kind of let them know that, that you're just not all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> but notice David's response. He says, send for him. Go get him. Get him out of that barren land. 
Get them out of that place where there's no word. Get them out of that place of isolation and bring them to me. Bring them to the king's house. And as soon as Mephibosheth enters the room, he falls at David's feet. And David asks, are you Mephibosheth? Now, if you notice here in verse 6, listen at how they describe Mephibosheth. They said, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, That's significant because you would only do that if you were introducing someone of royal lineage, someone of great importance. You would mention who their father and their grandfather was. That's how royalty was introduced. But look at how Mephibosheth describes himself. He falls on his face before David and he says, here is your servant. I'm nobody, David. I'm just a servant. And I want you to see what happens next because it's what God does with every one of us. It's a moment of grace in Mephibosheth's life. David looks at Mephibosheth and he says, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm going to honor my covenant with your dad. And by honoring my covenant with your dad, I'm going to restore to you everything that belongs to your family, and I'm going to treat you as one of my sons, and you're going to eat at my table. Mephibosheth, you're not a servant. You're royalty. You're not a slave. You're going to be treated like one of my own sons. Now, you have to ask yourself, What did Mephibosheth do to deserve this treatment from David? Nothing. He did absolutely nothing. Nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it. He received it because of the covenant his father made. He was the beneficiary of an agreement his father made. What did you and I do to deserve the grace of God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was a covenant that was made between the father and the son on our behalf. That you and I, a covenant of love that we get to share in. In Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And none of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And tonight I can hear the voice of God saying that over us here in this room. Who is there in this room that I can show my grace to? Who is there amongst these people that I can pour out my favor and my love and my, my you know, extravagant grace? Who can I pour it out on? And Jesus stands up and says, all of them, Lord. I know these that have been living in a far land. They've been living in a barren place. They've been living in a place where there's no word. They've denied the fact that they've been created in the image of God as big, powerful. They don't know that they're sons and daughters of the king, that they're made for glory, that I have something great for them. They don't know that yet. And God says, go get them, son, and bring them to me. And Jesus comes and rescues us right where we're at. We didn't come looking for him. He came looking for us. We weren't hungry for him. He was hungry for us. And he found us, brought us into the family, adopted us, and says, from this day forward, you will dine with me at my table and you will be my sons and my daughters. And in Galatians 4, 6 through 7, it says, Because you are my sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, saying, 
uh, hearts crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We are heirs to everything that God has given the son. We get to share in all of that. Now, some of you got to get your strut on. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in a trailer in South Carolina. I'm poor white southern trash. I know it's hard to imagine. You can take the boy out of the trailer, but you can't take the trailer out of the boy. And there's times when I fall back into it and I lick my plate and, uh, you know, I do <laughs> kinds of crazy things, you know. My wife thinks, <laughs> looks at me and goes, where did you come from? Well, I can tell you. But, you know, learning to grow up and walk as a son of God, as a daughter of the king, to leave behind the things that don't matter anymore, that don't, aren't befitting a people of God, the things that so easily beset us, the things that trip us up, the things that keep us from loving him completely. We're now heirs to the throne through Jesus Christ. The second thing that happens is Mephibosheth receives the benefit of the king's faithfulness. In 2 Samuel 9, David gives everything that belonged to Saul and his household to Mephibosheth, and he appoints Ziba to take care of it. Now, it's interesting because, you know, we really don't know that much about Ziba until he begins to kind of reveal his heart. And in 2 Samuel 16, Ziba comes to David and begins to accuse Mephibosheth of overthrowing David's throne. And, you know, it's interesting because wasn't it Ziba that accused Mephibosheth of being lame to David? The enemy that comes in and tries to accuse us before the father. And in 2 Samuel 16, verses 3 and 4, we read, Then the king said, And where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is staying in Jerusalem, for he said, Today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. So the king said to Ziba, Here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And, and Ziba said, I humbly bow before you, that I may find favor in your sight, O my lord and king. And Ziba totally lies to David. But David believed the lie. And he gives him everything that belongs to Mephibosheth because David thinks Ziba's telling him the truth. And, and, and so David is kind of repaying his kindness. Here, I'll, I'll give you everything that belongs to Mephibosheth as a way of saying thank you. But when David returns to Jerusalem, he's baffled because as he's coming back to Jerusalem, guess who's coming out to meet him? Mephibosheth. You know, the guy that's trying to overthrow the kingdom you know, it's, it's not there trying to stab David in the back. He's welcoming him back. And we read in, in 2 Samuel 19, verse 24, it says, Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. And so it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king, because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your table, Therefore, what right have I still to cry out anymore to the king? I mean, think about that. Mephibosheth was the first person that goes out to meet David when he returned. Of all people in the city, it was probably harder for Mephibosheth to get there than anybody else. I mean, think of how a lame man gets around. And how he would get to the edge of the city to meet the king. He couldn't walk. 
He hasn't cared for his lame, disfigured feet. He didn't trim his mustache or, or wash his clothes. He wanted to go with David. You know, that's really what he wanted to do, but Ziba stepped in and, oh man, you're lame. You can't go with David. You'll slow him down. I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll let David know. And Mephibosheth was just sick over the situation. He was sick over the way Ziba lied. He was afraid of what David would think because in his mind, he's not convinced fully that David is as kind as he is. He still thinks that David maybe hates lame people a little bit. And I meet many Christians that even though they've experienced God's love and yet maybe God isn't as loving, maybe to other people is loving, but maybe not to me. Maybe he's still a little upset at me. And so he's waiting for David to return. And when David asked, why didn't you go with me? Mephibosheth lets him know, my servant ripped me off. He lied to you about me. I don't know if you've ever had people lie about you. But it can make you sick inside, can it? It can really mess you up, depress you. Because you can't do anything about it. But Mephibosheth trusted David. And so he said, David, you've been so good to me. I didn't have any of this stuff before you came into the picture. I was living in the land of Lodabar. I was, I, I was in a barren place, and, and I had nothing. And, and then you come into my life, and you put me at the king's table, and you're giving me an incredible food. You've welcomed me into your family. You gave me all of this. I had none of this stuff before you came into the picture, David. Do whatever you want with me. You see, that's faith. That's faith. When you come to that place where in your relationship with the Lord, you say, you know what? I had nothing before you, God. I had no hope. I had no purpose. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know who you were. I didn't know anything about what you had for me. I didn't have a future. And Lord, since you came into my life, I've, you've made me your son. You put me at your table. Do with me whatever you want, Lord. I believe there's someone here tonight. You need to surrender to the Lord. You've been fighting the Lord. And you need to say that to the Lord. Lord, before you I had nothing. Do whatever you want with me, Lord. Do whatever you want with me. You know, the accuser accuses us before God day and night. But the Bible tells us that we overcome. In Revelations 12, 10 through 11, it says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. And so how do we overcome the accuser? How did they overcome the accuser that would accuse them day and night? First of all, it says we overcome the accuser by the blood of the lamb, by the fact that our sins are forgiven, that when Jesus died on the cross where the penalty for our sin was paid, it was paid once and for all. And there's this very expensive word. You have to buy a very expensive commentary to understand what it is. It's a word called propitiation. And what it means is that at the cross, that the Jesus was our propitiation, it means that all the anger, all the wrath, all the hatred for all the sin that was ever done by all mankind for all time was poured out on Jesus until it was fully exhausted. Until there was none left. And so now, with Jesus dying on the cross, when he said, it is finished, he meant it. It is finished. It is complete. There's no more payment for sin left. Once and for all, it was done. God is no longer angry at you. You've been forgiven at the cross. 
And we overcome the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, I'm forgiven. And it says, by the word of our testimony. What is the word of our testimony? What is the word of our testimony? Most of us think that it's how we came to Christ. And that is our story, our journey of how we came to God. But I love what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, the word of our testimony is this, that there is no condemnation any longer. That I am no longer condemned for my unrighteousness. That, that in Christ, I am now the righteousness of God, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. That I am forgiven, that I am washed clean, that I am holy, that I am set apart for Him. That is my testimony. So the next time the accuser comes and tries to accuse you and, tell, and lays a trip on you by bringing up your past sin or even maybe something you did last night or five minutes ago as you're driving to church, the person that you waved at in that very special way, you look at them and say, you're right. You're absolutely right. I did that. I sinned. But praise God. Jesus died on the cross for all my sins. And I am no longer condemned. I'm no longer judged because I am now forgiven by Jesus Christ. And he declares me righteous. And there is nothing you can say or do that will ever change that. Amen? I may not be where I want to be, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. And tomorrow I'm going to be somewhere else. Amen. Because I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on with Jesus. The third thing, Mephibosheth responds by loving the king. You know, the response of grace is to fall in love with Jesus. That's the real response of grace. 2 Samuel 19, 29 through 30, it says, So the king said to him, Why do you speak any more? Of your matters, I have said, you and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth says to the king, rather, let him take it all. Inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. He says, let him have it. I have what I wanted. I wanted you. You came back. That was enough for me. Just to kind of recap, you know, in 2 Samuel 15, David left Jerusalem because his son rose up against him. In 2 Samuel 16, Ziba lies to David about Mephibosheth to make him appear disloyal to David like Absalom. In 2 Samuel 19, David finally refers to Jerusalem, uh, returns to Jerusalem, and, and who's the first one to meet him? Mephibosheth, the lame guy who couldn't walk. And, and when David is acu uh, co uh, confused and says, you and Ziba, you guys work out your differences, split the land and the money, Mephibosheth no, says, no, let Ziba have it all because all I want is you. You're the one I, I care about. I want you in Jerusalem, David. I want you on your throne, David. I want to eat at your table, David. I want to be one of your sons, David. You see, that's the heart of a man who has experienced grace. They turned to Jesus and they said, Jesus, I don't care what this world has to offer me. This world can have it all. Take this world. Give me Jesus. I want you, Jesus, to be ruling and reigning in my life, Jesus. I want you to be on the throne of my life, Jesus. I want you to be the one that I dine with. I want to sit at your table. I want to be one of your sons. I want to be one of your daughters. Nothing else matters to me. It's just you, Jesus. And God takes our lame, disfigured lives out of the barren land where there is no word and he brings us into his palace and he lavishes his love and affection on you and I until our lives overflow with the goodness of God. And he says, never again 
will you live like a son of shame. You are a daughter and a son of the king. When, um, when I was learning about the grace of God in my life, and I was very busy, I was very active, um, I wanted to do everything I could. I mean, my wife will tell you, we were, we were like, every night of the week I was doing something, you know. I was running the youth group, I was doing worship team, I had worship team practices, midweek service. And, um, and in my life, I just, I just wanted to serve the Lord. I wanted to do whatever Jesus wanted me to do. And I thought I was doing it because I loved him. But I was really doing it because I was hoping that he would notice me and that he would love me. I was so busy trying to catch his attention, do all these great things for him. And um, I remember, you know, it, it, it even got to the point where I was, I was like, Lord, I don't even need to talk to you. We don't have to talk. We don't have to have a relationship. Just kind of fax me your orders. You know, just kind of give me a, a little breakdown of what you want me to do, and I'll run off and I'll accomplish that, and just, hey, a high five at the end of the day, whatever, you know. That's enough for me, Lord, because I am just a servant. That's all I am. Just a, a lowly servant. I'm just your servant, Lord. I don't need anything special. And so we were getting ready to go um, back east to do some conferences and minister and... Um, and I'm preparing, and I'm like, oh, Lord, I want to be, I want to just do, I want to do you well, and I want to do great for you, and, and, and I'm preparing, and, and all of these things, and, and I, Lord, I'm just your servant. I just want to be a good servant. And as clear as I could hear, I just heard the words, you know, like Trump, you know, you're fired. <laughs> and I remember starting to weep. Because I just felt this overwhelming sense of, oh my goodness, I'm, I must have really done something wrong, that God would fire me. And, um, and I was like, Lord, please don't fire me. I'm your servant. I just want to do, I just want to serve you. And the Lord again said, you're fired. I was like, Lord, what did I do wrong? And he says, you've done nothing wrong. He goes, but I have no room at my table for servants. I only have room at my table for sons and daughters. Because you can come as my son, but not as my servant. And that moment changed my life. That moment changed my life. Did I stop serving the Lord? Oh, no. I became more passionate in serving the Lord. But I wasn't serving him because I was trying to earn his attention or his affection. I wasn't trying to get him to notice me. I was serving him because I loved him so much that he made me his son. And he would invite me in and teach me out of his word and reveal himself to me just blew my mind. I believe tonight there's some of you that you just need to be fired tonight. And you need to accept and believe and receive the truth that you are a son and a daughter of the king. And he invites you to come to his table, to learn of him, to learn his ways, to know Jesus, to be a Jesus people community that gathers around and fellowships and loves one another. Because he doesn't want people out there doing things out of guilt or obligation, he wants us to do things out of love because we love him. And he loves you. And he doesn't want you to live any longer 
as a son or a daughter of shame. But the Bible says he changes our names. He gives us a new name. He gives us his name. The name that is above every other name. He makes us his people. He gives us his spirit, his power to do great and awesome things. Never again live as a son and daughter of shame. You are a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.